praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a good, good praise this morning. Come on, give a big shout. Say team for their awesome, awesome worship. Come on, give the Lord a good praise. And they are the ones that prepare the whole atmosphere every time we come together, right? And if we're talking about revival, how many know that worship, praise and worship must be part of the revival. That's what leads us into a revival uh, atmosphere. And it's so awesome just to be here this morning. I, I, I brought with me uh, one of the brothers, uh, uh, Brother David, and I'm going to ask him to just come and just share a quick word of testimony, if that's okay. Praise the Lord. He's been in the home for a few months, and God is doing a great work in his life. This is David. Amen. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David, and I, I'm in the men's home right now, Santa Rosa, and I got there four months. And uh, I'm just so thankful, you know, uh, before I came into the home, you know, um, I was raised up, uh, I was involved in gangs, and uh, I was using a lot of drugs, and my life just started going uh, downhill, you know, I went through a lot of things, I was in the street, I was homeless, I was miserable, I lost everything, I lost my family, I lost everything that, that I had, you know, but as soon as I stepped into the men's home, you know, I found an encounter with, uh, with Jesus, and he, he saved my life, he set me free. And, uh, and then I started to see and realize that, that, that all the things that the devil wanted for me to kill and steal and destroy me, Jesus turned that around and he healed me, he restored me, and he saved me. And I'm just so thankful for the man, so I'm thankful for the pastor, for everybody right here. And I'm just so grateful, you know, uh, God's changing my life and he, he broke those chains away, you know, he broke that yoke of bondage and he set me free and I'm a new creation and, and I'm a new person now, thanks to God, you know. I found Jesus, and I'm so thankful, you know, and I'm on the right path now, and I'm so thankful for the, for the home, you know, because if it wasn't for the home, I wouldn't be here. I'm not even supposed to be here. I should have been dead, you know, but by the like, grace of God, he, he saved me, you know, I'm so thankful. Yes. All right. Thank you. Come on, give the Lord a good, good praise. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's make some noise for Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. We get excited. We get excited not only to go watch the Green Bay Packers, I mean the 49ers over here and the Raiders, right? But we get excited when we come to church. We come to church and we worship Jesus together. Praise the Lord. And part of the revival is a roaring church. Part of the revival church is to become a roaring church. Come on now. Come on now. Do I hear that roar? Hey! Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. And this morning, obviously, I'm very excited not only to be here, but I'm excited to be a part of a powerful, powerful ministry, a worldwide movement, Victory Outreach International. Very, you should be very glad that you're part not only of an awesome movement, but a powerful local church here in the city of Fremont. Come on. Come on. You should be excited about that. Because, you know, this is a movement. This is a church that continues to stay excited and on fire for God and for people. We see what God is doing, what God has done. But then also, we see what God continues to do. Individuals like David still finding a new life in Jesus Christ every single day in our ministry of Victory Outreach. Come on now. We're giving life to people, right, through the ministries, and we are so, so excited. I want to thank also uh, your pastor, Pastor Anthony, and, uh, and, and his wife, Angelica. They're awesome pastors, and I, just, I love them both very, very much. And, of course, the leadership here at uh, Victory Outreach Fremont, Thank you for your invitation. I believe that God wants to go ahead and minister to all of us here this morning. If you go ahead and stand to your feet now and, and, and go ahead and get your iPad or your iPhone or your Bible. Come on now. And I want, I want to open it up just with one scripture that is found in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Praise the Lord. I believe that God is going to give us... 
uh, a word here this morning, and we're not going to be the same. I believe that God is really going to minister to all of us, so I pray that you will pay attention, that you would, uh, you, you know, stay still for a moment and just receive what God has for each and every one of us. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 18. If you have it, say, I got it. <clears throat> the Bible says that when Jesus came into the district or region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the, men of, that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, or they say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Jesus answered him, Bless, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Father, we just thank you for your word. I pray that you minister to every individual. Use my life to encourage, to speak truth to others today. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated here this morning. Praise the Lord. I've been in, in the church there in Santa Rosa for 25 years now. And, and God, is, uh, God has blessed us. God has blessed us tremendously um, there in our city. We we're able to be a part of a couple of international works to be able to, to uh, you know, be a part of Victory Outreach International. And God has used us to do things for his honor and glory. And I'm excited. But as I was driving here, and I was talking to David. I used to live right here in, in Union City. I used to live in Hayward. And, of course, I used to live in Oakland. That's where I grew up. And so I was talking to David a little bit. And I was just thinking back on how when I got saved and the beautiful things that God did at the very beginning. I was thinking about, of course, I'm coming to Fremont. So I thought about, about Louis, who has been here in Fremont for quite a few years. Praise the Lord. And and Brother Louie and I, we, we worked together uh, way back when, uh, when I got saved and then God started doing something in my life. And then and God allowed me to open up a, a, a uh, Spanish ministry, Spanish-speaking ministry uh, there in the city of Hayward. And I remember that we were looking to open up a rehab home because there was a lot of need all over Oakland, East Oakland. We used to go and do street rallies in East Oakland on East 14th on Fruitvale Avenue. And there was many heroin addicts. And I remember that I went to Pastor Stephen as a pastor. I don't need a rehab home director. And there was another guy named David. Remember David? But uh, at that time, uh, we were looking at, at, at Louis. And we looked at Louis. And Louis, Louis, you know how to speak Spanish. And, and I think he said two or three words. And he said, you, you, you qualify. Let's go. And uh, he did, of course, a great job. We were able to reach many drug addicts, Spanish-speaking individuals. And, and uh, uh, yes, give the Lord a good praise. And so I remember that. We got a building in East Oakland, 88th and East 14th, I think it was. And, and we did a great, uh, God did a great thing there through our lives and, and established that. So that church was birthed in my living room. They were in Union City. I used to live in Union City and. And I started doing a Bible study in my, my house, and, and, and it started to grow, and, and then it became a church. Today, today is the church there in Hayward, the Spanish church, which is a regional church over here in this area. And so, so it's always great to, to, to remember back what God did at the very beginning when he first touched us. Praise the Lord. And then also... We were thinking about there in Union City as well. I had a three-car garage house, and I remember that we started reaching teenagers. And we opened up a youth home with, with young teenagers who, who were gang members and drug addicts and all that at a very young age. And we had like 10 or 12 of them in our garage. Come on now. <laughs> Youngsters, man, you know, 16, 17, 14 years old. And they were, you know, going to church in a little line, just like the men's home, but teenagers. Those were, those were some great years that, that we go back to and we, 
we think about and we remember the beautiful things that God has done in our lives and through our lives. But then also we understand that this is only the beginning. There's so much more that God wants to do. There's so much more that God is doing. And this is your opportunity. This is our opportunity together to make a difference together. To make a difference and to continue to move forward because Victory Outreach International, Victory Outreach as a movement is not dying down. In fact, Victory Outreach International is continues to expand all over the world. It's continuing to expand all over the world, and we're excited to be a part of it. Amen. If you're excited, give the Lord. This portion of scripture, as we read here, is very important for all of us, and we, most of us, understand what the Bible says here. But I will read it one more time and go right into the sermon here this morning. But he says that Jesus was ministering, and he came into this specific area of Caesarea Philippi, and his disciples were with him. So he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do they say that I am? And they say, some say that you, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but what do you say that I am? Who, who am I to you? And Simon Peter replied, one of his disciples, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus answered him, and he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. I want to talk to you a little bit about, about the title that I've given is the Unstoppable Church. I want to talk to you about the Unstoppable Church. As you, as you can see clearly here, the Bible says that, that no one is going to be able to stop the church that he was about to build. Nothing is able to stop the church that Jesus is building, right? Now, this particular verse, though, is very often misunderstood and misused. Um, because Jesus is responding to Peter's declaration that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He declares Peter to be blessed for understanding this and states that his understanding was given to Peter by God himself. In other words... You got a revelation directly from my Father. This was not revealed to you by your flesh, by your understanding, by your intellect. This, this was revealed to you straight from heaven to you, and you just voiced it out. You was able to hear the sound of heaven, and you simply voiced it out. He says, blessed are you. Now, in 2005, Pope Benedict, Reminded a crowd, reminded a crowd, listen to this, of 50,000 people in St. Petersburg Square that the foundation of his authority is the rock of, on, on which Jesus founded the Catholic Church. The rock being the Apostle Peter, he says. In his remarks, he urged, let us pray so that the, prim the primacy of Peter will be increasingly recognized in its true meaning by brothers not yet in communion with us. Pope Benedict was proclaiming that all who call themselves Christians and Catholics should acknowledge the Roman stand as the unique and singular head of the Christian world. Meaning that Peter, Peter was the one that God established to be the head of the church. Now, a careful study of this portion of scripture, of this passage, reveals something very different from what Mr. Benedict said, right? In the original Greek text or language, the Greek word for Peter is petros, which means a small, a small stone. And the Greek word for rock is petra, petra, a huge rock or a mountain. Now listen to me because this is important. The words used here are as follows. I tell you that you are Petros, small little pebble. Hello? Peter, 
And upon this Petras, different word, this big rock or mountain, I will build my church. So Jesus was not saying that he was going to build his church on Petros, Peter. But Jesus says, I'm going to build my, my church on the revelation, the big rock, the solid foundation that my father just revealed to you that I am the son of the living God. On that revelation, on that rock solid truth, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Come on, give the Lord, give the Lord a good praise. Come on, give a little shout. Come on, say hallelujah. We are the church that Jesus says that will stand no matter what. No matter what comes our way, no matter what opposition we may face as a church, as individuals that are following Christ, God is giving us a promise that nothing is going to be able to stop us, nothing is going to be able to destroy us, nothing is going to be able to hold us back because God is the foundation of the church and the power of God is unlimited and there's nothing that can stop the power of the living God. Come on, somebody need to give him a good praise. He even states on there and he says, in the gates of hell, the very gates of hell shall never be able to prevail against his church. The gates of hell. Now, in ancient times, the gates of hell or the gates of fortified cities, strengthened cities, were used to protect those who were inside the city and to stop those who were on the outside from coming in, from invading the city. Gates were usually placed of great strength. Jesus' statement means that neither the plots, the strategies, nor the strength of Satan and his demons would ever prevail or stop the church from advancing and taking souls and territory from God for his honor and glory. Come on. The church is unstoppable. The church is unstoppable. According to Jesus. According to Jesus, the church, his church, is unstoppable. The gates were used to, 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 to fortify or to strengthen a city and to protect a city. And everyone that would come in, any stranger that would approach that city, they would have to come to the gates. And if somebody would open the door for them, somebody with authority to open the doors will allow them in. But if we don't want them in that city, we don't open the doors. Jesus is saying that the gates of hell are not going to be able to stop the church. Meaning that, meaning that the church is to invade. The church is to invade into the enemy's territory. Into the enemy's camp. See, some people think, some people think that that the devil is after the church. Some people think that the devil is messing with the church and the, and the devil's coming in against the church and the devil is trying to stop the church. And Jesus says, I established the church to be the other way around. What do you mean the other way around? Jesus says, the gates that are supposed to stop you are not going to stop you. It was, the gates were not meant to chase anybody. The gates were meant to protect from invasion. The church is to invade into the enemy's camp. The church is to move forward and take territory from the enemy's camp. The church, you and I, are called to move forward and take ground from the enemy's camp. Come on, somebody. I need to give him a good praise. The gates of hell will not be able to stop the church from advancing. He says, huh? We're going to break through those gates. And we're going to continue to move forward. That's what he says. This is, this, is, this is the mindset that we as a church must have. We must have that mindset. 
If we're talking about a revival church, if we're talking about a revival, I want to let you know that this is the mindset that the church needs to have. Not only the pastor. Your pastor is a beautiful person. Him and his wife, they are Holy Ghost filled. They are Holy Ghost led people. But they got to have a team of leaders and the people around them who are also the same way, that are also seeking God's direction and the Holy Ghost and being led by the Holy Spirit and fire. Why? Because they want to establish an end time church, an unstoppable church and they are doing what they can and they are pursuing the will of God and they're chasing after the fire of the Holy Ghost but they need a group of people. They need a leader so around them, to stand around them and say, we want to chase after God. We want to also pursue the power of God. Come on, somebody need to give them a good praise. See, God created us, listen, God created us three-dimensional. God created us three-dimensional. Each and every one of us, God created us, body, spirit, and soul. Three-dimensional. Every one of us has these three parts as an individual. And in Genesis 2, 7, you see that clearly. He says, he says, And the Lord God formed men out of the dust of the ground, the body. Out of the dust of the ground, he formed the man. And then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the spirit. <sighs> Put the spirit in it. So now it's spirit and body. And then the Bible says, lastly, and man became a living soul. That's the soul. The body, God established, God created us. The body first, out of the dust of the ground, right? And the body had to be made because he put us in a physical world. A physical world. Everything that is not physical, that doesn't have a physical body in this world, is illegal. Hello? It's illegal in this world. That's why the Holy Spirit is not just flying around. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. He had to take a physical body, take possession, live inside a physical body. So God created us. With a physical body because we live in a physical world and he called us to govern this world. So if we are to govern this world, he called us to communicate in this world. To live in this world, to walk in this world. So he created us in the body. And then the Bible says that he breathed the breath of life into it. He put his spirit in there. Put a spirit in, in, in that body that was lifeless. Now he's got a spirit. And then the Bible says he became a living soul. The soul, now let me tell you the, 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 the breath of God into the body is the spirit. And that spirit is the only one that communicates with God. Listen to that because it's very important. That, the breath of God into the lifeless body is the only part of man that communicates with God. The spirit of man is the one that communicates with God, who is a spirit. That's the connection between, between God and man. So now, man is in a physical world with a physical body, able to communicate in this world, but also God places his spirit so that man can also communicate directly with God. A direct communication with God. And then the soul, the Bible says that he woke up. The minute that he put his breath in him, he woke up. And then the intellect, the, 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 the mind began to work. And he was aware of things and awake. And that's the soul, the mind. The ability to make decisions, to rationalize. That's the soul of a person. So now you are body, spirit, and soul. And you will see that all throughout the Bible. The, the, the body, the spirit, and the soul. Now, 
Because man had contact with both worlds, heaven and earth, he had to be able to communicate with both the spiritual world and the physical world in which he lived. That's the way God created us. Also, a second scripture that we see that states that the, the, the same message here is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. You can write it down. Read it later. And he says, may God himself, listen to this, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It describes the three dimensions of a man, of a person here on earth. The body, the spirit, and the soul. Now, why is this important? Well, I get to that in a moment. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, the last scripture to establish this truth. In Genesis chapter 2, God gave Adam a warning. And this was the warning. He says in verse 17, But you, Adam, must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it or from it, you will surely die. You got all this food, all this fruit, all this that I created for you. Eat it out of anyone, out of any of those trees. But this one don't touch. Because the minute that you touch this one, the minute you eat from it, the minute you eat from this one, you will surely die. Well, we know that Adam and Eve, they ate of the fruit. And we also know that they lived some 930 years after they ate of the fruit. Did God lie? He didn't die. He, he didn't lie. God is not a man that he shall lie, the Bible says. What happened there? Well, his body didn't die. His soul did not die. He was, he was aware of everything. He was alive. What died when he sinned was the spirit man inside of him. The ability to connect with God directly was cut off the minute he sinned. He died in the spirit. He died. He was walking around for 730 years. After he ate the fruit, he would go places, he would go everywhere. But his ability to connect with God from the inside, directly with God, was done and over with. That's why in the Old Testament, when you look at the Old Testament, where was God? God would show up and God would lead from a cloud. He would speak from a cloud. He would come in a, a fire by, by night and, and a cloud by day. God would speak to them. In fact, what they would do in the Old Testament, they would carry the presence of God in a box. The Ark of the Covenant. Under God's instructions, they built this ark of the covenant, this box. And God says, I will be with you from this ark. That will be my presence. Everywhere that you take the ark of the covenant, my presence is with you. So they would carry this, and, and they would carry this box, and that was God's presence. Why? Because man was not able to communicate because man was dead on the inside. The spirit, the part that was able to communicate with God at one time directly was gone, was dead. All throughout the Old Testament, you see this. They cannot communicate directly with God because it was dead. It died the minute he sinned. So now you fast forward that. And God says... I want to fellowship with my people. I want to communicate. I want them to have a direct line with me one more time. Because I'm about to create revival throughout the land. And revival cannot be created without a direct line of communication between man and God. 
So I got to, I got to fix that. So what did he do? He got his son Jesus Christ and he says, you must go. And Jesus says, I'll go. I'll pay the price. What price am I going to pay? I'm going to pay the price and put away the very thing that disconnected mankind from God Almighty. I'm going to put away the sin. I'm going to pay for the sin that they committed that disconnected them from God. I'm going to go and I'm going to pay for that. I'm going to pay on the cross of Calvary. I'm going to die on the third day. I will rise again that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They will connect back with God and have a direct connection with God Almighty. Come on. Somebody need to give him a good praise. Jesus says they're going to have an opportunity to connect directly with God one more time. I'm going to open up the door again. Where the spirit of man is going to be able to communicate with the spirit of God. You know when God touches you and, and you feel God's presence and God ministers to you. And, and when, you, when, when you break in the presence of God. Your flesh don't know how to deal with, with, with that connection. When you connect with God, the spirit man inside of you. When it's alive and you feel God's presence and you begin to cry, it's because the flesh don't know how to deal with, with what's happening in that connection between your spirit and God's spirit. When that connection is made, the, the body don't know. Some people start running. You see them running this way, running. Some people start jumping. Some other ones just start shouting. Some of, the body's reacting to something that's happening from your spirit to God's spirit. When there's that connection, something happens. Something powerful happens. Jesus said to Peter, he, he, said, he said, this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood. This wasn't revealed to you by your carnality, by your intellect. This wasn't revealed to you by your feelings or emotions. This wasn't revealed to you. By any of those things, any of those means, this was revealed to you directly from, from God's Spirit to your spirit, and you simply spoke it. You spoke what God showed you directly from heaven. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, this was not revealed to you by your own means. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. You just had a supernatural connection between your spirit and him. Come on, somebody need to give him a good praise. Now... Now, I, I, now, now that we got that part taken care of, I, I want to I get to the part that I believe is very important for us as a church. Your pastor has a heavy, heavy calling, you know? You know that. Part of his calling is that, that he's not here today because he's taking care of business at a much bigger level than just the local church. He's been called to do that. He's a special man of God that God has called him and his family, his wife, to operate at the level, at the international level. I was just with him uh, about six weeks ago, maybe. We got to go to a conference in Arizona. And as we were there at a revival church, powerful church there in Arizona, I got to connect with him a little bit more. And I can see he is a man that is, is after the spirit of God. And both of them are hungry for more of God still. They want more of God. And in talking with them, I can see and I can sense the, 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 the desire from your pastor to build an unstoppable church. A revivalist church. A fired up church. A church that is going to make a difference here and in and, and the north. In Northern California and around the world. His desire is in him and he is Holy Ghost led. He's led by the Holy Ghost. He's making connections with people. He's connecting in different ways. He's trying to learn different things. He's trying to bring the music and connect you guys over here and over there. He wants the, the, the sound of heaven. He wants the roar of heaven to be in this church. 
He desires that. He's going after that. And I admire that big time. But then I also realize, and he's talking like that, I realize that a man or a couple that are Holy Ghost led, a man or a couple that can connect their spirit to God's spirit and make that connection are not going to be enough to keep an entire church to become unstoppable. This is where you and I come in. I realize, I realize that what Pastor Anthony and Angelica need, first of all, and they know that, they need the leadership. They need the leadership to also be Holy Ghost led. That are individuals who are pursuing, are pursuing God's spirit and the, and the Holy Ghost uh, leading the church. They, 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 we all need that. Every pastor needs that. That the individuals that, that, that are surrounding us, the top leadership in the church, those that are being used behind the pulpit and preaching and all that, that those will be individuals who are seeking the Spirit of God and, and the Holy Ghost led and, and, and in prayer and fasting and they know that they want the mind of Christ. Because a Holy Ghost church is led by leaders who are Holy Ghost led. Led by the Holy Ghost. And I want to challenge you, my brothers and my sisters. Because it is important for every one of us to understand that we must connect that, that part. That part that connects with God must be open and ready to connect with God. Many times, many times... Many times, what happens is that the desires of the flesh, the body, hello, the cravings for this world, the cravings for accomplishments, hello somebody, worldly accom earthly accomplishments, many times get in the way and they begin to, they begin to bury the, the spirit of God within the man that needs to connect with God. Many times, my brother and my sister, the cares of this world will press you down and will keep you down. And, and many times, we cannot connect directly with God because we are overburdened with so many things in this world that we cannot really connect with what God really wants to do. And it is important for us to understand that as God has called us to build His church, as God has called us, to strengthen the church and to reach people and, and to be able to encourage people and bring healing to people. It is important for all of us to understand that we must develop that connection with God. Yeah. We must connect, we must develop that direct connection with God Almighty. That's where power comes from. That's where the anointing comes from. From the spirit of the living God. Right? Now, the world... The majority of the world don't know what I just talked to you about. They don't have no idea about the three-dimensional person that God created. They don't know. They just go with their feelings, their emotions, and all that. That's why we're messed up everywhere, and, and nothing works, and everything is messed up, right? But when we come to church and we begin to understand this, then we need to begin to protect that part that connects with God. We need to begin to protect that part that connects with God. What messed up? What messed up the connection? Sin. Sin messed up the connection at the very beginning. So because of that, when you come to church, we preach and we minister to you. And we try to live our lives also disconnected from sinful behaviors. We fight to try to stay focused and stay in the spirit because we understand that God has given us a calling. We have a responsibility. And those that begin to come in and connect with God, the first thing that God would want to do as you come to Him is to accept Him as, as your Lord and your Savior. Because the moment that you do that, He'll reconnect your spirit back to His spirit. And there is a direct line between you and God. And then nothing is impossible in your life when you are connected with God. God. Come on, somebody need to give him a good face. 
See, the unstoppable church is led by spiritual leaders who are God-led. Hello. The Bible says, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. You had a direct connection with God. That's how you came up with this truth. See, Jesus recognized that Peter had a special ability to hear the sound of heaven. He recognized, whoa, he was able to recognize, to hear my father speak to him. Wow. This is what we're looking for in a church. This is what we're looking for in our leadership. Individuals who are able to recognize God's voice and follow it. And follow it. Because it is important to establish an unstoppable church. The church that will move forward, the church that will make a difference, the church that will continue to reach out to the right and to the left, the church that is going to continue to see the treasures out of darkness come out and get saved, the church that is going to continue to raise up a third waivers and young people to follow God, the church that is going to be able to keep the fire to the very end and to be able to be a testimony to the world that there is a God who called us and there is a God that established his church and he said that his church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against this church. This is us. We need to walk. We need to talk. We need to do ministry and life together because God is the one that gives us the victory. Come on somebody. You see, when you begin to Together, when you begin to seek God and go after God and understand that we must be Holy Ghost led as individuals and then as a team and in the leadership, when we begin to do that, you, this is what happens. When you begin to seek God and hear the voice of God and follow the voice of God together with your pastors, when you begin to do that, then they learn to dream bigger. They learn to dream bigger. A lot of times we're not dreaming. In fact, sometimes we don't even dream no more. Sometimes we're so caught up with the here and now. Sometimes we're just dealing with, with, with what we can see with the natural eye. I said sometimes we're just dealing with what we see with our natural eye. And we cannot really see what God really wants to do. Jesus, Jesus brought his disciples. He brought his disciples and they went to buy food. He stayed at a well in a Samaritan town. And the Bible tells us that he was there because he was thirsty. He said that a Samaritan woman, a beat up woman, a rejected woman, came to the well to draw water at noon, the Bible says. Everybody else came early, but she came at noon. Because she was rejected. Nobody wanted to talk to her. So she looked for opportunities to come, to come to get water when there was nobody around. Because everybody will get on her. You are no good. You're this and that. So the Bible tells us that Jesus was there and she came. And then the Bible says that, that he started talking to her. Then she got saved. She went to her town because he ministered to her. And he, she went to her town to tell everybody else, hey, here's the Messiah. But the Bible tells us. That the disciples came back and they said, man, I, I, I wonder if somebody gave him food because he's not hungry. And he said, my food is to do the will of my father who called me. But then he started walking and the Bible tells us he started walking and he says, he says, wake up, open your eyes and see. Don't you say four months and then the harvest? I tell you that the harvest is plentiful right now, right now, right now, right now. When he said to them, wake up, they were awake. They were walking with him. They were awake. But he was speaking again to this part that needs to connect with God. He was speaking to that part that says, look, your eyes are just right here looking at the natural. 
But I want you to begin to lift up your eyes a little bit more from the natural. And I want you to begin to see in the spirit, in the supernatural, the things that I want to do. You're saying four months and you're going to be able to have a harvest of corn. There was corn everywhere. And Jesus says, you see the corn? Lift up your eyes and see. You see the corn? You said four months and there will be a great harvest over here. But I tell you, if the seed of corn is able to produce this great harvest in Samaritan territory, rejected territory, how much more, how much more the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the seed of the gospel will give us a greater and a bigger harvest in this territory. Come on, somebody. Jesus says, wake up, open your eyes, and look at the fields. Come on, begin to see. You say, oh, yeah, for months there's a harvest. So the harvest is ready right now. He wasn't talking about the corn. He was talking about the harvest of souls. Everywhere he went, everywhere Jesus went to minister, there was crowds that followed him. He would go minister at a house, and he was so packed out that some of, the, some of the individuals that were outside in need, the Bible tells us, that they were able to carry a, a, a paralytic. They brought him up, and they brought him, but they couldn't get into the house. The Bible says they had to go on top of the house and cut a hole on the roof, and they lowered the individual right in front of Jesus. That's how packed the place was everywhere Jesus went. So Jesus began to talk to them and he says, I don't want you to look at the corn that is out there and the harvest. I, I thank God for your new car and your new job. I thank God for your material possessions and the blessings that God gives you and how blessed you are. I thank God for those things. But I don't want you to get stuck on the corn. I don't want you to look at the corn and how well you're going to do in the harvest of corn and how good you're going to do in your business this year. I want you to know that's important, Jesus says. But I want you to look up. I want you to wake up. And I want you to see in the spirit what God wants to do. What God wants to do in the East Bay, in North California. What God wants to do in the church of Fremont. What God wants to do in your family, in the spirit, what God wants to do in your marriage, what God wants to do in your life, in the spirit realm. Come on, somebody need to give him a good praise. God wants to do more than just bless you and meet your needs, than just bless you and meet your needs. Ten lepers came to Jesus and said, Jesus, look at us. We're all messed up. Can you help us? Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest. What that meant was, if Jesus is telling them to go and show themselves to the priest, they had to get an approval, like a medical uh, clearance. That they were healed. So they started walking towards, 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 towards the individuals that needed to get the clearance from. And as they were going, the Bible says, as they were walking to get that approval, that clearance, that they were healed. The Bible says one of them realized that he was healed. Out of all the ten, when one saw that he was healed, the Bible says that he stopped walking in the direction that he was going. And he turned around and he came back and he ran to Jesus and he threw himself at the feet of Jesus, thanking him and praising him for the healing that he had received. The Bible tells us that Jesus looked at him, and then Jesus says, wasn't there ten of you? Why is it that only one has returned, and he is a Samaritan? Ah, Samaritan. This is the place where the disciples were going, and they were just looking at the cornfield. This is the place where they were saying, wow, the harvest. And Jesus says, raise up your head a little bit more. Raise up your eyes a little bit more. Because there's a revival of souls. What happened with the other nine? How come only one came back? And the Bible says that when he came back and gave things to Jesus, he, they, Jesus told him, your faith has made you well. 
The other nine that went, listen, 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 listen. This is important for some of you. The other nine, as the other nine went and moved forward, and they continue on with their lives because they were healed and never came back to give thanks to Jesus, they were healed on the outside. Their body was healed. They were not bleeding no more. Oh, come on. Their physical needs were met. The corn was good. A great harvest of corn. That's wonderful. But when Jesus says, where are the other nine? Only one. A Samaritan came back. Your faith has made you well. That part that says he made you well, that means that he was completely healed. Not only on the outside, but on the inside. Hey, God says, God says, I don't want to just meet your needs on the outside. I want to touch you on the inside. I want the spirit man to be alive again. I want you to wake up to the fact I want to do a new thing in your life. Come on, somebody need to give him a good praise. God wants to do a new thing in our lives. God wants to do a new thing in our church. God wants to do a new thing in Fremont. God wants to use Pastor Anthony and Angelica on all the levels while other individuals are being raised up to take care of business. Come on, give the Lord a good praise. And you know what that does? With a bigger mentality. Hello? He said, man, everything was good. Come on, say, man, it's been good. Come on, say, it's been good. Don't stop. Come on, say, don't stop. All right, I won't stop. It gets even better. It gets even better. An unstoppable church is led by leaders who are led by God. And because of that, they start dreaming bigger. And when they start dreaming bigger, that means they have a bigger vision. They begin to see bigger what God has. Everything that God has for your life is bigger than where you are today. Every day, if you get to connect with, with the Spirit of God, God would always show you bigger things and better things in your life. Some of you are missing out on what God has for you, which is much greater and better for your marriage, family, finances, every area, simply because you neglect the connection between you and God sometimes. And God says, if you connect with me a little bit more, I begin to reveal to you bigger things I want to do in your life. God, God wants us to get a little closer to Him so that He can bless us more, reveal more to us, and use our lives to a greater level than we ever thought possible. Sometimes, man, I got I to gotta pull my ears, even though they're big already. I, 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 sometimes I pull them a little bit more to wake up to the fact that God is able to use the nobodies. Come on. God is able to use the nobodies, the people that come from the hood, the people that come from the gang, people that come from violence, gang violence and God says I don't care where you come from I don't care where you've been I don't care where you're done I don't care about your past if you are able to surrender and let your spirit be open that I can minister to your spirit I will bring you up I will use your life I will use your life for my honor and my glory come on somebody need to give him a good praise come on somebody shout hallelujah I'm almost, almost done. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and be seated just for a moment. But as the, big, as the, as the, as the vision is enlarged and it gets bigger because we're making this connection with God and we're working as a team and we're all pursuing God's will and God's Holy Spirit leading us. As we do that, our vision and our dream for this church, for the ministry, for our lives, enlarges. It gets bigger. And as it gets bigger, I say it this way. I say it this way. An unstoppable church, an unstoppable church that we're trying to build is a generous church. It has to be a generous church. It has to be a generous church. I say it this way. I say it. The biggest pain or torment for a visionary 
does not have the resources to get it done. The biggest pain and struggle and torture inside of a visionary is not having enough resources to see the vision accomplish. Your leader is a visionary. Your leader is a dreamer. Your leader sees big things for this church. Your leader sees big things for your family and for you. Your leader sees all those great things and he sees where he needs to go. Because God shows him the next step and what needs to be done for the church and the next level of growth and what's going to happen. But many times, my friend, we cannot accomplish that without resources. This is where God is calling every one of us and say, it is time to become a generous giver in the house of God. We have a great vision. We have people. We have leaders who are led by the Holy Spirit. They see what God wants to do next, but sometimes our hands are tied. We can't move forward in accomplishing the dream that God is giving us for the church because there's no resources in the house. And it's not because God is not faithful. It's not because God has not blessed the people. It's sometimes we are looking at the outside. We're worried about the body. We're worried about the soul. And we forget about the spirit. Because the spirit moves by faith. It connects with God. And he says, oh, I can see it's not just about the corn. I can see it's way beyond just the natural things that I can see. And it begins to work to accomplish the supernatural that God has for the church and for our lives because we're able to see it. But many individuals are so concerned about their own personal needs. Individuals are so concerned that they do not release the resources. Some of you may have resources. Some of you, God may, 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 be, may be blessing you and you have a struggle releasing your tithe and your offering. And I want to challenge you today just like I challenge our church. I got, there's no shame in my game. There's no shame in my game. I know what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to accomplish. And that is the will of God. I want to take my city for God's honor and God's glory. I want every drug addict, every gang member, every youth. I want the juvenile hall. I want the prison there. I want all of them to know and to get a chance to accept Jesus. I want to give them a message of hope that was given to me before. I want to take, uh, I want to go to the different parks in our city. I want to go to the parks in our city and be able to, to, to go put up shop right there and be able to bless the community by every park. I want to be able to do this for the children. And it requires resources. But when the house has resources, we're able to do everything that God has called us to do. When we connect with God, God makes it possible. Come on. Somebody need to give him a good praise. Now, Pastor Anthony and I didn't, didn't talk about, about anything, me preaching here. I asked them, though, is there a theme? Is there a... And he says, no, whatever the Holy Ghost gives you. Whatever the Spirit gives you. So I was searching and seeking the Lord and said, why do you want me to tell the Freeman Church? He said, tell them. That their pastor have a special calling. And that special calling requires a special team of leaders around him. And because there is a special calling for him, there's a special calling for them to be influencers in Northern California at another level. They need to take their place. And they need to see themselves in the spirit the way that God sees you in the spirit. God has called you to work together. To <laughs> this was another point that I had, but I'm not. To not be a person that takes too many selfies. You see that brother? He's taking pictures of this guy. Huh? But sometimes when you're working in leadership, some, some guys... Like to just, just, just take selfies. 
if you're going to preach, hey, this is, I, I want my flyer. I want, I want it on Facebook, on Instagram. I want it on TV. On, I want it on, on YouTube. I want, it, I want it everywhere. I'm preaching. Hey. <laughs> somebody else is preaching. Don't make no noise. Because somebody, God wants us to, as we seek the will of God and the spirit of God, God leads us. God wants us to, to honor one another as we work together. To respect and honor one another in leadership. And to understand that not only my position in this leadership is important, but your position is very important as well. Your place, your place in the ministry, brother, sister, is so vital and important in the ministry. If you lead worship, oh, I pray for you. And you're doing a great job. And, 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 and that, that the person will understand their calling. If you're leading worship, that you would have a vision to grow the worship. To take it to another level. Don't just do ministry. Have a vision to grow it. That, 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 that's what we desire as pastors. That when you are over a ministry... That you have a dream to make that ministry everything that God wants it to be. And in order to see how God wants to build that ministry, you got to connect with God. You got to have the direct connection. If it is the children's department and you oversee the children's department ministry, that you have a heart for that ministry, you understand how valuable you are, but you have a vision for that ministry as well. Every ministry within the church is so vital and important. Every leader within the church is so vital and important to keep or to build an unstoppable church. That when everybody's doing their part, God will do an amazing thing in the church. Remember, there's some people who are called to be leaders and they are leading those ministries as I'm, as, 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 as I'm getting ready to land here. Some of them are called for specific tasks and assignments in the ministry. But every one of us is called to contribute financially to the work of the ministry. You may not be a leader in the house, but if you're a child of God, if Jesus is Lord in your life, then He's called you to also support the work of the ministry. To be generous in your giving. If you do that, you're helping your pastor, you're helping your leaders, and you're helping this church and the movement to keep on moving forward for God's honor and God's glory. The last thing that I want to say is that unstoppable, the unstoppable church is able to identify opportunities, God-given opportunities even in the midst of the, of the most difficult circumstances. An unstoppable church is able to identify God-given opportunities even in the midst of their most difficult circumstances. They remain focused and they see beyond their struggles. They remain focused and they see beyond their trying times that are here. They see beyond the natural to see, I'm going to get to the other side. Father, thank you. We love you, God. We love you, God. Don't lose focus. You can stand to your feet and give the Lord a good praise. What I'm saying here is, don't lose focus. Don't lose focus on what God called you to do. And be open to identify the opportunities that God is giving you, even in the midst of your struggles, even when you are struggling, God is bringing opportunities into your life. Come on, everybody standing. Please, no moving around. If you want to lift up your hands, lift up your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are building an unstoppable church in the city of Fremont. We are building an unstoppable church here in the East Bay. And God is calling your name. God is calling you. Some of you have been here for a while. And you're involved in ministry, perhaps even leadership. 
Some other ones are a little newer here in the, in the body. I want to let you know there's room for you here in the church. God has called you. God has called us together. And God wants you to get closer to Him. To open up your heart and be able to just call on the name of Jesus. This morning, lift up your hands. Lift up your hands as we begin to sing a song. Come on. Just lift up your hands in the presence of God. Let your spirit connect with the spirit of God. after the Spirit of God. A people that are tired of just depending on their earthly blessings and are saying, God, I want more. I want more of you, oh God. I want more. I want to I wanna feel your presence. I want to I wanna have a fellowship with you, oh God. I want you to minister to my life. People who say it, I will make this area of my life available to connect with God. The Spirit in me will connect with God. I would allow time to be able to connect with God because I want to see God move in my life and in my church like never before. If it's you here today and God is ministered to you today, I want you to get out of your seat. I want to pray for you. I want to let you know God wants to heal your body. God wants to heal you. God wants to get you, make you well from the inside out. Hey, come on, from all over, from all over. You said, I want the fire of God in my life. Come on, let's sing it, let's sing it, let's sing it. Hey, come on. 